Well, good morning, everybody. We're so glad that you've joined us. I want to wish a special happy Mother's Day to all you moms out there, mothers, grandmothers, stepmothers, spiritual mothers. We're so thankful for all that you mean in each of our lives. And I want to say happy Mother's Day to my own mother and the mother of my children, both of whom live here with me at home. We've had lots of good togetherness time in the midst of sheltering in place. But we're also thankful for the moms in our lives. So happy Mother's Day. I've got to tell you this morning that I have one mother in particular who's heavy on my heart and my mind. That's a mother named Wanda Cooper, whose son Ahmad Abre was recently gunned down in the streets of a neighborhood in Georgia. And uh, as followers of Jesus, I think we need to be reminded to grieve with those who grieve. And there are many, not just this mother and her family, but many around the country who are grieving this tragedy. And that we as followers of Jesus need to be reminded that that we're called to be people who pray for and who strive for reconciliation and justice. Reconciliation and justice are themes that are woven throughout the pages of the Bible because they are near to the heart of God. And IBC, I hope that reconciliation and justice will be near to our hearts as well. Now, this morning, we're continuing in our sermon series called Easter People. Uh, that, that in these weeks after Easter Sunday, we're talking about what does it mean for us to live in light of the reality of the resurrection? What does it mean for us to be Easter people in our everyday lives? And this morning, we're talking about the idea that Easter people give extravagantly, that we recognize that we have been the recipients of the extravagant gift of God through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And in response to that, we give extravagantly back to him. I got to tell you, though, I was a little nervous coming into this Sunday, thinking about the fact that once I introduced the topic, that the number of viewers might drop dramatically pretty quickly. Because we all know that it can be a bit uncomfortable hearing a preacher talk about giving. But I want to let you know at the beginning here today that, that there's nothing about this sermon that's at all about guilt. Because God doesn't want us to do anything we do for him motivated by guilt. God wants us to do everything that we do for him, motivated by gratitude for the grace that we've received. So if if I make you feel at all guilty today through this sermon, I've failed as a pastor. Today's not about guilt, and, and it's not about anything that, that we need from you as a church. That, that This isn't because we find ourselves at a time when, when finances are tight at IBC that this was a sermon that we planned five months ago as a part of this series, recognizing that that we don't want to come to you and talk about this because we have some kind of need from you. This isn't about what we want from you, but about what we want for you, what God wants to do in you and what God wants to do through you. Now, I'll admit that as a preacher, I can feel a little uncomfortable talking about money, because I know what it's like to sometimes listen to messages about money. But Jesus, interestingly enough, didn't seem to have a problem talking about it. Jesus talked about money all the time. In fact, 16 out of his 38 parables deal with money. One out of every 10 verses in the Gospels speaks about money. If you look at the whole Bible what you find is that if you take all the verses that talk about faith and all the verses that talk about prayer and you add them together, you get about the same number of verses that talk about money. That's not because God needs your money. God does not have a need that any of us can provide. But it's about recognizing that God wants something more for you. And this morning, I think we're going to see a bit about what that means by looking at a story that's told in Mark chapter 12. So if you have a Bible, grab it and turn to Mark chapter 12. And we're going to see where Jesus um, points to the example of a woman who shows us something about what God wants from us as extravagant givers that has nothing to do with the size of our gift, but that has everything to do with the condition of our hearts. 
Now, interestingly enough, right in the lead up to this passage, Jesus has been talking about money several times that in in Mark chapter 10, he has an encounter with a man that we refer to as the rich young ruler. And he recognizes that this man who presents himself as one who wants to follow after Jesus still has an inordinate attachment to his own wealth. So Jesus challenges him and says, take everything you have and sell it and give the money to the poor and then come follow me. And the man turned and, and walked away. In Mark chapter 11, Jesus comes into Jerusalem and he goes into the temple court and it's there that he turns over the tables of the money changers because he recognizes that what's happening is that these money changers are exploiting the poor and the vulnerable. In Mark chapter 12, Jesus talks about the idea of paying taxes to Caesar, to give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to give to God what is God's. And then we come here to the very end of chapter 12 and we see this little scene captured in just a few short verses, but that has so much, I believe, to say to us by way of instruction, inspiration, and challenge. In the context, Jesus and his buddies have been in the temple courts. Jesus has been teaching. He's been having run-ins with the religious authorities. And then we come to the end of the chapter, chapter 12, verse 41. And it says, Jesus sat down opposite the place where offerings were put in. And he watched the crowd putting in their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. And calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in everything, all that she had to live on. The, the scene is that Jesus and his disciples have been busy with all kinds of things there in the temple courts. And now they've sat down and they're people watching. And this is during the last week of Jesus' life, which is the week of the Passover, that the population of Jerusalem at this time of the year would swell by the thousands. And so Jesus and his buddies are sitting down and they're watching people. And they're sitting in the area where there are these collection boxes The Mishnah tells us that in the temple courts, there were 13 shofar chests, a chest for offering that the top of which was shaped like a a shofar, a ram's horn, wide at the top and then narrowing as it goes down to to keep people from reaching in and, and taking what they wanted. And so what that meant was that as people came to give their offering, no paper money in that day, everything was coins. And so as as they came and they gave their offering, it would make a sound. And I can't help but imagine that the disciples are sort of making a game out of this. They're watching people come and throw in their offerings into these shofar chests. And they're checking out the different people and wondering who's going to make the loudest sound. Right? Looking at people's appearance and their dress and wondering uh, whose offering is going to, to resonate the loudest in these boxes. And then along comes this poor widow woman who has just these two tiny coins. The King James refers to them as the widow's mites. And she drops these two tiny copper coins into that shofar chest and it hardly makes a sound. But Jesus recognizes a teaching moment and he calls his disciples and he points out the woman and he said, she gave more than anybody because she gave everything she had everything that she had to live on, that she is the one that despite the fact that that her offering is is almost nothing, that these two little coins, lepta in the Greek, these two lepta would be the equivalent of about 1 64th of a day's laborer's wage. This is what an average day laborer could earn in six minutes worth of work. This is almost nothing, and yet for her, it is everything. It's everything that she had to live on for that day. And Jesus says, this gift is extravagant because she gave everything she had. And I think from this little story, we can find some things, again, that instruct, and inspire, and challenge us. I think the first thing that we have to recognize is that her extravagant gift both demonstrates and shapes her love for God. That, that this gift that she gives demonstrates the fact that, that she loves God, that, that he has her heart. And Jesus will talk about the connection between our money and our hearts, where he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
that, that Jesus recognizes that our money follows our heart. That what we love, we don't have a hard time giving money to. Um, you have been, over the course of the last number of weeks, getting a peek into my office. And sitting behind me are a whole lot of books. And what you find is if you go to my office at the church, you find a whole lot of books. right? I love books. And I don't seem to have much trouble spending money on books because we don't have a hard time giving our money to the things that we love, that our money follows after our hearts. But interestingly, Jesus actually recognizes that the opposite is true, that our hearts follow our money, that what he says is where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Your your money will follow after your heart. This woman gives as an expression of her love for God because he has her heart. But but even as she gives, her love deepens. Here's what I think we need to recognize. God doesn't want your money. He wants your heart. He's just smart enough to realize that the one is often attached to the other. And so he invites us to be people who give extravagantly because that extravagant gift both demonstrates and shapes our love for him. But I think the second thing that we see in this story is that that it also demonstrates and shapes her faith in God. Right? That, that for her to, to make this gift, to, to give all that she has to live on for the day, is a, a radical demonstration of faith. What I find interesting is the, the passage actually says that many rich people threw in large amounts. And sometimes people who comment on this passage, or, or preachers, will, will point to this and offer some kind of judgment about the fact that there's something somehow wrong with these rich people. But I don't think that's what you see in the story at all. There's nothing inherently wrong about being rich. And there's nothing inherently wrong about rich people giving large amounts. In fact, we would love it if some rich people gave large amounts to Irving Bible Church. There's nothing wrong here. The the thing is, the point that Jesus is making, by contrast, is simply the idea that they gave out of their riches, but they're still rich. That, That they give, and it doesn't really impact them. That they still have plenty to live off of that it doesn't take some great act of faith for them to give. They give, but they don't really feel it. And uh, when I'm really honest with myself, I have to recognize that sometimes that's the way I operate. How much can I give without really feeling it? And yet this woman, she feels it, right? She gives all that she has to live on. This is a a radical demonstration of her faith in God. Um, there's an offering that's prescribed in the Old Testament that, that always my mind goes back to. It's, a, it's called the offering of the first fruits. And it's, it's so interesting because the idea is that a farmer who's growing grain, for example, those first heads of grain that pop up in his field, the expectation was he was to go and take those heads of grain And he was to go to the temple and he was to offer them as an offering, as a sacrifice to God. And in that culture where people are are eking out a living by the sweat of their brow, they're barely making it through life, that that those first heads of grain popping up, that's hope, right? That's some sense of assurance that I've I've got grain to put bread on the table or I've got seed to plant my crops next year if something happens to the rest. And yet the expectation was they were to take that and they were to offer it back to God. And this was a a demonstration of faith, a way of saying, God, I'm giving this to you because I'm trusting you that there's more to come. I'm trusting that you're going to take care of me. And and see, what this is is not only a demonstration of faith, but it also shapes their faith. Because God doesn't want your money. God wants your faith. But he's smart enough to know that your faith doesn't grow if it's not stretched. 
And when we give extravagantly, when we give when, to the point we can feel it, it stretches our faith. And for many, the challenge in that is recognizing that maybe the deeper question is, can we trust him? Can we trust him to provide for us? Can we trust him to take care of us? And I think that on this Mother's Day, it's great for us to remember a verse of scripture that's one of the most beautiful verses in all the Bible that actually compares God's love and concern for us to that of a nursing mother. In Isaiah chapter 49, verse 15, Isaiah writes, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child that she has born? Though she may forget, the Lord says, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. For her to turn loose of those coins was an act of faith in the God who would not forget her. That, that this extravagant gift both demonstrates her faith and shapes her faith. God doesn't want your money. He wants your faith. But he's smart enough to know that our faith doesn't grow if it's not stretched. And I think the last thing then that we see in this little story, in this act of extravagant giving, is that her gift both demonstrates and shapes her commitment to something bigger than herself that she's throwing this money into the temple treasury. And that's her way of saying, I want to be a part of what's happening here. That the temple represented God's work in the world. And and her contribution, small though it may be, was a demonstration that she wanted to be part of something that was bigger than herself. What's so fascinating for me is to think about the fact that this woman very well may have actually been one who benefited from the generosity of others. Right, that as a poor widow, she may very well have benefited from generous gifts that other people had made. And yet she doesn't then say, I want to just take that and keep it to myself. But I actually want to be a part of what God is doing through the temple. I want to be a part of what God is doing in the world. That her contribution demonstrates her commitment to something that's bigger than herself, bigger than her family, bigger than her immediate needs. And God wants all of us to be a part of something that's bigger than ourselves. That here she demonstrates that that she's committed to that, but it also shapes her commitment. For when she gives, she's drawn deeper into that place of commitment. The fact of the matter is, God doesn't want your money, but he wants you to be a part of what he's doing in the world. And he recognizes that oftentimes these two things are closely connected. That what we give towards, we care about more deeply. And so as we give to what he's doing in the world, we are drawn thereby into a deeper place of commitment to his mission. Friends, God doesn't want your money. He wants your heart. He wants your faith. He wants your commitment to what he's doing in the world. He just is smart enough to recognize that all of these can be connected back to what you do with your money. God doesn't want your money. He wants you. He wants to do some things in you and through you. He wants to shape your heart. He wants to shape your faith. He wants to shape your commitment to his mission. We who are Easter people give extravagantly because we recognize ourselves to be the recipients of an extravagant gift from God through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. He doesn't want us to give anything out of guilt. He wants us to give everything that we have to give out of gratitude. And so I think the challenge for all of this this morning is to reconsider our giving in light of what God wants for us, not what he wants from us, and that we truly would give extravagantly out of gratitude for that which we have received.
The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians makes a pretty remarkable statement when, when he says this about Jesus. He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Jesus had the comfort of heaven, and yet, because of his love for us, was willing to set that aside and to be born into poverty, to be born into nothing, and to endure all the hardships that this life has to offer, and ultimately to go all the way to the point of giving his life as a sacrifice, to to take on the weight of our sin, and then to triumph over it through his resurrection from the dead, that he was rich, became poor, so that we who were poor, we who were spiritually bankrupt, we had who had nothing to offer to God in any way to commend ourselves to him, we who are spiritually bankrupt might become rich by receiving the grace of God, by receiving the righteousness of Christ. He became poor so that we might become rich. And in response to this reality this morning, we come to the table, the table of thanksgiving, the table of the Eucharist, our communion with God, where we say thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done for us and and are reminded of our union with God and our union with one another. And so this morning, I hope that you have the elements nearby because we're going to partake together now. We're going to remember the extravagant gift of God to us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The Apostle Paul says that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the bread together now. Paul says, in the same way after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the cup together now. Paul says, whenever you eat this bread and when you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Easter people give extravagantly because we recognize the extravagant gift of God towards us. God doesn't want our money. He wants our heart. He wants our faith. And he wants our commitment to his mission in the world.